be talking. Hi, everybody. I should say howdy from <laughs> East Texas. I'm in my little cabin in the woods, Murphy's Law, and I have a Texas icon with us today. I have the radio personality and author, Tumbleweed Smith. Welcome, Tumbleweed. Nice to be here with you. So glad to be here. My goodness, I have heard so much serious stuff this morning uh, about lifting up, etc. I hope to lift you up with a little bit of humor today. Yeah. All right. Shall I start? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I was going to thank you for the intro, but uh, <laughs> I didn't get it. I didn't we, get it. I'm we, so we, sorry. We somehow, somehow missed that. But I got to tell you about an introduction. I think introductions uh, kind of set the mood for the whole speech. Uh, Tana Hodge is the uh, Chamber of Commerce manager in the little town of, uh, oh, let's see, uh, Rockdale. And uh, she was, um, she was going to make a speech. And she said, now I want you to get my name right because it's Tina. It's it's spelled T-I-N-A, but it's spelled Tina. You know, looks like Tina, but it's Tina. And the guy said, "Okay, I'll try my best." So when when he introduced her, he said, "Ladies and gentlemen, here is Tina Hodge from." Oh my goodness, I I really have hurt her. She's from Menard, Menard, Texas, not Rockdale. She's from Menard, Texas. So it, when the guy introduced her. He said, ladies and gentlemen, here is Tina Hodge from Minard. <laughs> oh, there, there you go. A lady in Sheffield was, uh, she doesn't get out very much and she was feeling bad. So she went to the doctor in the nearby town of Ira Ann. Well, the doctor said, ma'am, have you been through menopause? And she said, if it's not between Sheffield and Ira Ann, I haven't been there. <laughs> uh, oh, that is funny. I have a lady in, in, uh, in uh, out in West Texas in Sierra Blanca. She was driving and she pulled up in front of a service station and she pulled up away from the pump from the pumps a little bit. And she went up and talked to the man and said, sir, do you have a restroom? And he's a little bit hard of hearing. And he said, no, ma'am, I don't. But uh, she, she, uh, she asked for a whisk broom. He thought that she asked for a whisk broom. And uh, the man said, no, ma'am, I don't. But if you'll pull it up a little bit, I'll be glad to blow it out with the air hose. <laughs> uh, an, an older lady who remarried after being a widow for a long time uh, ran into a longtime friend that she hadn't seen in years. And the friend asked her, said, well, tell me about your new husband. Does he take you to exotic places all over the world? She said, oh, no, he doesn't do that. Well, does he pamper you with lavish gifts? Nope, doesn't do that either. Well, does he shower you with affection? No, no, -uh, no, not, no, no, uh -uh. well, why did you marry him? Well, he can drive at night. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, a 99-year-old woman in Seminole, uh, I, I met her the other day. She said, I can't see, I can't hear. Thank goodness I can still drive. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, I, I hear your laughter and it's wonderful. It, it, you talk about encouragement, that's encouragement <laughs> to me. I love to uh, chronicle Texas humor. Um, I love to uh, interview very, very fascinating Texas women. I've been doing my radio program for more than 50 years and have met some outstanding ones. I'll tell you all that. Um, one lady I met <laughs> makes fruit cakes with a cement mixer. Another one has a landing pad for UFOs. Another lady makes purses out of armadillos. Another woman tap danced 18 hours to set a Guinness Book of World Records. I interviewed the first woman to wear Wrangler jeans. I interviewed Mrs. Pancho Villa. I've been doing this a long time. <laughs> I've interviewed uh, women oil field workers, ranch hands, soldiers, firemen, linemen, pilots, plumbers, carpenters, mechanics, and truck drivers. Now, these are not country bumpkins. 
Most of these women are educated. They own businesses. They're prominent in their communities and hold responsible positions in all kinds of endeavors. But they all like to laugh and make others laugh. I have brought the voices of some fascinating women with me today. Joe Bird of Rockdale was an executive at the Houston Ship Channel for years. She can't stand to ride in a vehicle with someone who drives slow. I've been stopped here in town speeding before, you know, well, I gotta tell you, honey, I can't stand that Jack drive, you know, it's my husband, bless his heart. You know, one day we we're driving along downtown and he's driving along so slow and <laughs> I said, well, I think we got a problem over here, huh? <laughs> He says, well, what, why, why, what's the matter? What's the matter? I said, well, we got a dog running along here wetting on the wheel. <laughs> I, I love it. You, oh, you, my gosh. Stuff like that is that is wonderful, wonderful humor. Uh, K. Baby Hunter of Rusk was Elvis Presley's hairdresser, and she has been in several movies. She has a great Texas accent which came in handy when she was in the movie, Bernie, which is all about East Texas. I was in the Cracker Barrel in Shreveport using the restroom and this lady kept going, lady, lady, are you that lady that was in that movie, Bernie? And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, well, I recognize your voice. She said, can I have your autograph? And I said, not right now. <laughs> Norma Clark is a blacksmith just north of San Antonio. Well, I groomed dogs for 18 years too, along with blacksmithing and the dog hair is flying all around and you don't have a cup of coffee, nothing without dog hair in it. Then I go home and work and I don't have a cup of coffee, nothing without steel in it. So boy, I got a steel and dog hair stomach. <laughs> you can call me a <laughs> <Rin> tin tin. <laughs> California is not the only state. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to laugh more than anybody else here, probably. California is not the only state with a Los Angeles. We happen to have one, too. It's in South Texas near Catula. About 10 people live there now. But Ruby Gebert says Los Angeles, Texas used to be bigger. They had a gin and a drugstore and a hotel and ice plant. What is the political situation here? Is there a mayor? Is what what? No, no mayor, no police, no highway patrol, no sheriff. Just rattlesnakes and good loving. It's a great place. <laughs> Lucille Mays of Odessa has worked at some of the finest cafes in Texas. She worked at the Roadkill for a while. During the Texas Centennial in 1936, she was a cigarette girl at Casa Manana in Fort Worth. Now, at one point in her career, she decided that she wanted to become a beauty operator. So she and a friend of hers enrolled in beauty school. And on the very first day of class, a woman came in and ordered an egg shampoo. It was the awfulest mess you ever saw in your life. The lady says, I want an egg shampoo. And I looked at Loretta, it was her first day too. And she looked at me and she, I said, what do we do? She said, well, we break the egg first. <laughs> I said, well, that's a, that's a good deal. And so we did. And then we put it on her hair and massaged it in, which I don't know if it was right or wrong. Yeah. But then, then we, when we got ready to rinse it out, we got the water too hot and he cooked it in there. <laughs> and, uh, and we got so tickled. <laughs> and the lady knew something was wrong. No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Donna Albus is on the city council in Abilene. She ran a campaign to get daffodils blooming all over Abilene. And then she was given the task of getting crepe myrtles spread throughout the city. Her goal was 3,000 crepe myrtle trees. She gave a speech about that. We talked to the newspaper guys, and at the end of their column, they'd say, hey, have you heard Myrtle's coming? Well, then a billboard went up. It was hot pink, and it was a silhouette of a Victorian lady with the hat on and a dress to here and all the way down to there. 
and it said, Myrtle's coming, get your bed ready. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> One woman took the oh no. Down, and she called the city manager who called me in and said, Donna, we have had a complaint that your billboard has sexual innuendo. <laughs> And I said in my normal, reserved manner, good Lord, Roy. <laughs> she also called the newspaper. AP Wire picked it up. She oh, called no. the TV station. <laughs> CNN picked it up. Oh, no. We heard from every state in the nation. We heard from Toronto, Canada, Sydney, Australia, and Tokyo, Japan. Oh, did I mention we sold 8,369 crepe myrtles? <laughs> so I'm here to tell you if you think sex don't sell, <laughs> it does. That's a great idea for Keep Your City Beautiful. <laughs> Joe Hodge has memories of the majestic theater in her hometown of Eastland. And at this Majestic, I saw Pinocchio for the first time. And I saw, oh, all the Planet of the Apes movies. We'd just stand up and cheer and scream and throw pickles, you know, <laughs> at the bad apes. That's the Majestic Theater. I've lost so many good memories in there. But, you know, first dates, last dates, you know, where you left. You know, I'm going to go to the bathroom and I'll be right back. He may still be sitting there. I don't know. <laughs> I never threw pickles in a movie theater. But <laughs> sounds Me like one thing. Linda Love had the Sonora Steakhouse for a long time. She got the Restaurant Tour of the Year Award once. She had a small pistol that had gotten dirty over the years because she never uses it. Her husband cleaned it up. He decided one day he would show me all his labor, how much it had paid off, and he brought it to me. And I stuck it, of all things, in the bank bag. I didn't even think a thing about it. Well, a couple of days later, when I took all the bank bags to the First National Bank of Sonora, I had, of all things, that little bitty gun in the bank bag. I saw everybody looking at me, and I thought, oh, my gosh, I've lost one earring or my eyelash is falling off over here or something, because I noticed they were all looking at me and then walking off and talking in little huddles. And then I saw the president of the bank come and look around the corner. Finally, he came over there and told me, Linda, you're supposed to keep this and point it at us. And then the money, we're supposed to hand it to you. <laughs> Joy Colwell of Colorado City is overweight and she kind of enjoys it. What are your measurements? Well, they're 36, 24, 36. And my doctor said that it didn't make any difference if you were fat as long as you're well proportioned. And I am because the other arm is 36, 24, 36. <laughs> Carolyn no. Waters taught school for 33 years in Harvard. Every once in a while, she'll run into a former student. Really gets you when they say, you haven't changed a bit. And I think, my word, did I look like this 40 years ago? <laughs> Stacy Barr taught music to first graders in Big Spring. This little girl walked up and she told me, Miss Barr, I need to go to the restroom. And I didn't understand her telling me that she'd already gone to the restroom in the floor of my classroom. And one of my other little first graders leaned over and said, clean up on all nine. <laughs> Very sharp first graders in Big Spring. <laughs> Ray Wagner lives in Harlingen down on the Rio Grande Valley. He was in the plumbing business. Yeah. Insurance credit is the most important. I'd rather you do that first. This is this is free I'm stuff we're getting from the insurance company. Uh huh. I'm being interrupted here. What, what's I'm trying. What? Uh, someone was talking. Go ahead. The, oh, uh, Joe Ray Wagner lives in Harlingen down in the Rio Grande Valley. Her family was in the plumbing business, so growing up, she worked for her parents. She later had a large plumbing contracting firm all over South Texas, and she was the first woman appointed to serve on the 38-member National Plumbing Board. The dress code was a tie. 
So for four years, she wore a tie to the meetings. She later became president of the board and changed the dress code. As a matter of fact, after wearing a tie for four years, they insisted I had to do that, or you have to pay the foundation $100. So when I set the dress code, <laughs> I said, I'm going to make a tie optional. I said, but you have to wear pantyhose. The foundation was elated because they got $3,700 for my first two meetings because those guys were not about to put pantyhose on. What a good wow. lesson. Uh, Susan Buckholtz uh, raises sheep near El Dorado. She has a hard time when she takes livestock to market. I name every single one of them, and they're just big pets. And so when it comes time to haul them off, all those fellas up at producers just shake their head when they see me coming, because I'll have big tears going down my cheeks, and I'll say, goodbye, jelly bean. Goodbye, milky mustache. <laughs> <laughs> Jacksonville used to have a brassiere factory that made Marja's bras. Cherokee County historian Dr. Deborah Burkett says it was a big business. In Jacksonville, they had five warehouses. They sold to Neiman and they sold to Fredericks of Hollywood. One item made Marge's known around the country. And it was a half cup bra that in the early days of the 40s was considered risque, but it actually was very, very popular. The name of that bra was the Western and the motto was, hitch them up and move them out. <laughs> Fort Worth used to have a fabulous night spot called Go Lightly's. It was a popular hangout for writers, musicians, and entertainers. Annie Golightly owned it. When she was in the third grade, the teacher had a contest. And the contest was, I had to roll a cigarette before a boy could thread a needle. The cotton pickers had taught me how to roll a bull Durham cigarette with one hand. <laughs> you know, it was a piece of cake. I said, this poor kid doesn't have a chance. You know, I've got it whipped. <laughs> no contest. A couple of interesting couples in the uh, interesting groups in the Texas mountain country are the Studi Butte Hookers, a knitting, a knitting and a crochet group, and the Terlingua Tassel Tossers, who do belly dances. <laughs> I interviewed the Tassel Tossers during one of their noisy practices. It's a bunch of grandmothers having fun. How often do you perform? Whenever we're asked only. We don't force it on anybody. <laughs> we also do uh, Hawaiian dances. Yeah. We started out as an exercise program, and, but we wanted something that was fun, too. So. And it is fun. How do you learn your belly work? <laughs> just, just keep working at it. Doing the dishes. Just wiggle it this way and a little that way, and away you go. That is a colorful bunch of women, I must tell you. Around 1970, Hondo Crouch of Lukenbach started a chili cook-off for women. He called it Hell Hath No Fury Chili Cook-Off. The winner competed in Terlingua. I have had the opportunity to be a judge several times at the chili cook-off in Terlingua. One time I got to do the finals. At one time I was there when there was a wedding in the old church in Terlingua. The church was decorated with chili peppers. There was no flower girl, but there was a pepper girl. The justice of the peace who performed the ceremony was Hallie Stillwell. Who gives Nancy Fowler Sebastian in marriage to Peter George Clay? Ma and I. <laughs> by authority of a license issued by the proper officer of the state of Texas, I am about to celebrate the rights of matrimony between Nancy Fowler Sebastian and Peter Clegg. Pete, will thou have this Nancy to be thy wedded wife? You bet. Will thou love her, comfort her, honor and keep her? Answer. You bet. <laughs> now answer, I will. I will. <laughs> Nancy, will thou have Peter to be thy wedded husband? Will thou love, honor, and keep him? I will. For as much as Nancy and Peter have covenanted together in holy wedlock and witnessed the same before God and this company, I pronounce them husband and wife. 
Here you may kiss your bride. <laughs> After the ceremony, there was a reception featuring chili and shiner beer. And then the bride and groom climbed on a burro to spend their honeymoon at Boquillas, which is just across the Rio Grande River. And when they left, the crowd showered them with pinto beans. <clears throat> I've, uh, I've met some talented Texans. Roxanne Ward of Littlefield has reached celebrity status by her ability to call hogs. There's a story behind my hog calling. I was raised on hog farms and I'm the oldest of four girls and pigs listened to me better than my sisters. So that's where I went and spent a lot of time. <laughs> and the most remarkable thing about my hog call is they come to me. Do you own a pig? Yes, sir. His name's Oscar Meyer. No, that's not gonna be his future. He's not gonna grow up to be a weenie. You must practice a lot. Every day. It's a good thing I live in the country. <gasps> I do it every morning and every night. Yeah, I spend a lot of time in the pig pens. Well, now you have perfected your art to a very high level. The World Championships at Weatherford, Oklahoma, and I've attended two years in a row, and I have won every contest I've ever entered. I've flown in my first airplane. I have tried my first cappuccino. I uh, got to see the ocean for the very first time in my whole life. And I have limousines, and I hog call down Fifth Avenue out the top of the limousine in downtown New York. Wow. <laughs> you never know where your talent's going to take you. Deborah Weingarten of Austin plays flute. And, you know, she takes that with her wherever she goes. And sometimes she gets it out and plays it in special places. I was in the rotunda of the state capitol and I looked around and I thought, wow, look at all this granite and this limestone. I'll bet the acoustics are fantastic here. So I pulled out my flute and started playing. And sure enough, the echoes were amazing. And then people started giving me money. And the security guard came over and said, I, excuse me, ma'am, but I'm going to have to arrest you. I don't think you have a license to solicit money here in the state capitol. At which point I tried to explain I was just trying to have a little flute experience. I wasn't expecting people to actually give me money. Deborah is an author. She has written several books. She says traveling with a flute is a lot easier than traveling with a trombone or a tuba. <laughs> <laughs> I meet uh, a lot of women with unique pets. PJ Hornberger of Round Top has a pet chicken. Sister Ernell. Yeah, I had her forever. She was wonderful. She liked to drink Coca-Cola and eat pasta salad. <laughs> she was the very best chicken I ever had, but she died. The lady called and said, there's a chicken running around next door in the pasture. She went out there and caught it for me with a dip net. She was going to go in, in her brand new Cadillac. And then she got out there and realized I'm in my Cadillac. I am not putting a chicken in my Cadillac. So she held her nail out the window of a dip net and drove all the way home. So her nail was kind of windblown when I got her. <laughs> and that lady's name was her nail. And I thought, well, you just deserve to have a chicken. <laughs> so we brought her nail home and she was, she was wonderful. Wonderful chicken. Oh. Dodie Kettler of Gatesville grew up in the country. We had an outhouse that set out over a branch. <laughs> it sat between two trees and it was called the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And I <laughs> thought all my life that that's what the Leaning Tower of Pisa was until I finally saw it in a book at school. You can't beat a good Texas accent. <laughs> I have met men with women's names and like Vivian and Beverly and women with men's names like Charlie and Tommy. A woman in Sulphur Springs is named Gary, Gary Hicks. Uh, from the chicken coop to the dinner plate, she knows how to prepare fried chicken. Well, you get a hold of this chicken's neck, you <laughs> ring it, and when you go over, you kind of <laughs> jerk it, that uh, breaks the chicken's neck. You take your other hand, you 
hold on to that chicken's foot, pull that head off of that chicken, stick that chicken down in the bucket so when he's cooking, he's not going to get blood all over everything. <laughs> if I want to fry that chicken, I soak my chicken in brine salty water overnight in the refrigerator that draws all the blood out of a chicken. Then you rinse it, you put it in uh, sweet milk, let it sit there for about all oh, 15 or 20 minutes, then I'll flour and fry it. And it is real good, and you should try it. I have tried it, and it is delicious. The pecan is the official nut of Texas. A lot of pecans grow around Crockett. This is Granny's Nut House. And I'm the chief nut. Hessa Faye Bobbitt has a pecan business in Crockett. She has a sure way of keeping crows out of her pecan trees. The crows that are hanging in my trees, my neighbor kills them for me and I hang them in the trees and the rest of them don't bother my trees. Put a string on them and hang them where the crows can see them. <laughs> Lee Harris, a historian in Fort Stockton, knows about pioneer days when women made good use of flower sacks. Everybody knows about diapers being made of flower sacks and cup towels being made of flower sacks. And the flower companies got where they would print uh, beautiful prints on them. And this was a good texture material. One lady had an experience with flower sacks. She was from up east and she married a cowboy. And he, she came down here and there wasn't a lot of material around. It was, you know, kind of slim pickings around. So she saved her flower sacks and she bleached it. She took it out and boy, she made these bloomers out of them. She fixed some ruffles on them and so forth, and she's so proud of being able to make her bloomers. Her husband came home that day, and she heisted up her skirt and said, see my new bloomers I made? And as she turned around, he started just cracked up and started laughing. And she said, what is it? And when he finally told her, right across in pink, she hadn't got all the letters out, and it said, pride of Texas. Mm, wonderful. <laughs> I've interviewed lots of uh, women involved in the oil business out here. When oil was discovered on Betsy Cowden Ward's land near Pecos, she headed west to see it. When it got through money hands, why I could smell the oil and I thought it smelled terrible. The time I got out there, well, it smelled so good. You betcha. <laughs> Marge Carpenter traveled to 126 countries, dined in the White House won hundreds of journalism awards, wrote three books, and was moderator of the Presbyterian Church. That's like the Pope. During her reporting days, she didn't like covering weddings. Once she was visiting with a woman in Pecos whose daughter was getting married. Big wedding. I mean, one of the oldest families in town. We filled the whole page up for this wedding. Well, she couldn't think of the name of one of the ushers. And I said, we'll just leave it out. No, no, can't do that. And I said, well, you know, it was hot lead days. You didn't just put it in the computer. And so if you, you could put in a fake name and then take that piece of lead out and put in another name at the last minute. So I put in John Q. Porkchop of Pocatello, <laughs> Idaho. Well, she forgot to call and he became an usher in that wedding. <laughs> and I got taken off of the wedding. Rita Rotenberg raises Peruvian Paso ponies near Dallas. She has llamas that keep the varmints away. Once she carried a llama named Chop to Fredericksburg for a llama kissing contest. This particular one loves to kiss. Everyone seems to be going by and kissing him. He's already got lipstick on his nose. He started kissing when people would come up and he'd just put his head over and start kissing. So we decided to have a kissing contest and see who he'd kiss the best and the longest and the sloppiest and that type of thing. Here he comes. He'll pucker up. Yeah, I can't tell you how many people stood in line so they could <laughs> kiss the lava. A woman in Odessa is a plant whisperer. She made a motivational tape for plants and then put it on a 45 RPM record. You are beautiful. You are thriving. You are growing. You are reaching to the ceiling, reaching to the sun, reaching to the sky. Beautiful, beautiful planet. I love you. For some reason, that record didn't make the charts. <laughs> 
Mary Lou Cassidy has been Midland's funny girl, <clears throat> funny girl, entertaining theater audiences for more than 50 years. Before retirement, she was an oil and gas attorney. I tended to attract a odd group of clients. In fact, sometimes they could walk in the door and the receptionist, we had like 15 lawyers. He said, I bet you're here for Mary Lou, just from the way you're dressed. You're barefooted and you have an Indian headdress on. <laughs> Joy Foggy of Johnson City played piano for church services where her father was the preacher. Some of the music she played was not in the hymnal. Slowing it down and making it very solemn. I did pistol pack and mom for the old story. <laughs> Daddy didn't even know it. <laughs> I can't tell you how many church organists and pianists I've talked to. And they had, they played music from Elton John and the Beatles and, and even some Elvis. Joy's sister, Ruth Blair, says they grew up in a very strict home. No card games, no Monopoly because it had dice in it no dancing, but when their mother moved into a nursing home, she had a different slant on things. They had sock hops and mom would get up and dance in her 80s and 90s, you know, and then when she got over here to the nursing home in Johnson City, well, they would play bingo and she would bragging about winning quarters and things. And I'd say, <laughs> mother, you used to not let us do things like that. And now you do things like that all the time. And she said, well, it used to be a sin. I remember when that used to be a sin, yeah. <laughs> when I interviewed the Cardwell triplets in Sweetwater, they were 84 years old, the oldest triplets in the United States. They were born in 1899 and were given the names Faith, Hope, and Charity. Us girls, we didn't have to have anybody to go play with somewhere. We had ourselves. First day we went to school, we all sat down on the little porch, you know, and cried our eyes out. We all cried at the same time. <laughs> and of course they had to send us home. Well, what happened when you started getting married? Who was the first one to get married? Hope and me, we married the same day. Hope says she and Charity got married together in a car. <laughs> right out in the middle of the highway. What? Yeah, let her tell you. In the highway. I just in an old car. I guess it's a Model T. I don't know. Brother Young married us. Then we went on the street water and went to a circus that night. <laughs> Can't think of a better way to spend your honeymoon. <clears throat> Sterling City is full of women who play bridge. The city has two women's clubs with unusual names. Cecil McDonald belongs to both of them. Why Madassas is one, that's the mother club. That stood for wives, mothers, daughters, and sisters. My mother was one of the charter members. Then they organized a club of, of us young kids in 1934, and we called ourselves the No Rate of Data because we couldn't get a date. So that's when we learned how to play bridge. Leela Jones owns Leela's place at Papalote down near Beeville. Her place sells beer and snacks now. It used to sell food. Had a little old six by eight hamburger stand. I stayed open all night and all day. I made hamburgers. <laughs> and I'd see somebody drive up and stop, and I'd grab a little water of that hamburger meat, and I'd just pat, 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 <laughs> pat slap it in on the fire, you know, and I'd have hamburgers made before you could say scat. How many times have you been married? Six or half a dozen, more or less. I killed them all. I just loved them to death because there was no law against loving a guy. Where are they buried? They're buried down here in my cemetery. And I was good enough to put tombstones to all of their graves. I saved up all my beer cans and bought me a sack of cement and stacked them and made pretty tombstones. And then I took my pistol and engraved the names on each can with my pistol, so I know which one was which. <laughs> oh my God. Customers come from. Oh, from one side of the United States to the other, to me. <laughs> you can't go nowhere. I don't care how big a town or how far away. If you mention Leela, 
Oh, you know her, don't you? Yeah, that's Leela. That's my chug. That's my honey. That's my girl. Don't y'all be flirting with my girl. Oh, I love them boys. But they they won't give me a chance to love them. Oh, no, she's she's they to be down here in my cemetery. <laughs> You want some uh, sophistication? I got some for you right here. Klaus Steinhagen of Georgetown spent some time in Japan as an entertainer, living with two housemates in a small town just outside Tokyo. They decided to celebrate Thanksgiving one year and introduce some of their Japanese friends to Turkey, which is very rare in Japan. It's sort of a novelty. So Clo took a bicycle ride, a train ride, and two subway rides to an American market. Took her a long time to get there. And she bought a frozen turkey. It was put in a paper bag and she started the long trip home with it. Things went well until she got to the final train ride. She had an aisle seat. All of a sudden, I look down and I see this little rivulet of pink, watery stuff running down the aisle. And I look at the bag and I can see this paper bag is wet. The turkey is beginning to thaw. I looked up and the Japanese, it was packed. They were looking at that water and I thought, oh my gosh, what's going through their mind? This is just awful. So we finally got to my stop <laughs> very rapidly. I picked up the bag to get off the train with my turkey and the bottom of the bag fell out because it was all wet and my turkey landed right in the middle of the aisle of this train. And <laughs> nobody said a word, nobody laughed. And I gathered up my cold, wet turkey and got off the train to get home to my home where I could ride my bicycle back to my house. How many of you had that happen to you? <laughs> <laughs> Texas women are smart, resourceful, creative, brave, energetic, patient, enthusiastic, generous, kind, worldly, sympathetic, confident, innovative, cultured, and dedicated. When they tackle a project, they don't stop until it's completed. They do things with a determination that men envy, and women do things men don't think about doing. Women do more than just cook and clean. Women give birth, serve on committees, run for office, plan social activities, and tend to the innumerable huge and tiny details of life. They're comfortable, relaxing in a resort, refinishing furniture, or running a corporation, or writing books. They strive for perfection. They look forward to what's next and know they can handle it, whatever it is. I'm glad that I got to know so many fabulous Texas women. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been a wonderful audience. Thank you very, very much. I'll be glad to entertain questions. Oh, that would be great, Tumbleweed. Well, okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it back to the gallery. If you, any of you, yes, Teresa oh, yes. Backen, yes. Yes, I just thank you so much, Kathy, for uh, bringing Tumbleweed to us. I haven't smiled or laughed so much in so long. My face hurts a little. <laughs> uh, and I just feel transported almost to like, I'm sitting on the porch with you. I just, I love your voice. And so I'm, I'm in this group as an audiobook narrator, not as a writer. And I just, I want to just take this opportunity to ask you for your secret or, or your best piece of advice for someone who is the person asking the questions. How do you get such amazing stories out of people? Well, thank you so much. I'm thrilled to death that we're recording this. <laughs> those, those compliments really mean a lot thank you so very much um in my interviewing i've been doing this uh 52 years my radio program i've been in broadcasting since 1960 uh, but <clears throat> i 
don't try to do an interview. I, I try to do a conversation. Mm. Uh, I, it's, it's a back and forth, you know, tell me about, you know, I did that one time or, you know, just, I, number one, put them at ease. And if you're doing yes. it with a microphone, uh, don't make any fast movements, you know, like they do in news. I was in news for uh, nine years, uh, mm -hmm. radio, television, news, and got tired of all the blood and politics and guts and all that. And, and, and realized that that is a minuscule part of life, actually. I wanted to report on life and mm. that's what that's what I do I mean I, I I do stories that encourage people that uh or make people laugh I mean I I do all kinds of things but uh you you, you had an interesting question how do I get those stories I I, I put people at ease uh I, I guess that that's the main thing yes. uh, and, and so many people tell me they hear they hear other people that I interview laughing and I don't know whether whether they're nervous or what. I don't know why they're laughing, but but every, almost every interview there's there's laughter from the people I'm interviewing, and uh, and and I think that's I think that's part of being uh, at ease and part of it being a little nervous. Maybe I I don't know what, but um, but they they feel comfortable. They feel comfortable with me. I yeah. love that. I love that. You definitely brought that to us today. I, I felt very comfortable listening to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. This, this is so much fun for me. Um, um, I, 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 I did do news for a long time and, and had some had some very success working for NBC and all that. Uh, and, and I did feature programs for the uh, NBC radio program uh, used to be used to be called Monitor. It was on from uh, from I think 56 until 76. And that, that's when I was uh, doing uh, NBC Monitor, interviewed mm -hmm. uh, all kinds of people. I, I, was, I started working at, uh, when I was started doing features on the network, when I was working for WHO in Des Moines, I interviewed an 11 year old blind girl. And she was so enthusiastic about life. And she told about running and jumping and, listening to television and she her exuberance just came over so well and mm. people at the station said why don't you send that to nbc monitor that, that sounds like something they, they would use and i said well sure <laughs> who, who can i say who should i send it to and they said send it to gordon frazier he's a producer of monitor so i sent it to him and he said uh, your interview with the 11 year old blind girl is going to be on uh, NBC radio on 2.12 12 PM Saturday afternoon. And my gosh, to, to realize that my stuff was going to be on national radio. Yes. And, and even around the world. Wow. Uh, that, that was, that was a thrill. That was a big, big thrill. And well, uh, why, why do you think audio connects with people so intimately, you know, I, I think you said it. I think it's an intimate medium. Mm. I really do. Um, you listen to it by yourself in the car a lot, you know? Yeah. And, and, and I think whatever the, is they're saying over the radio penetrates your, your soul. <laughs> uh, yes. You're, you're usually quiet. And uh, it, you, you, that, that's, that's the main focus of whatever you're doing besides maybe driving. <laughs> yes. And it's focus. It really is because you're not distracted by visual. You are just, you just absorb all of the characteristics of somebody's voice. You have such a wonderful voice. Oh, well, thanks, thanks. Um, I, I, I got into uh, this, this business because I, uh, I love America. I happen mm -hmm. to love America a lot. And, I, and of course I love Texas, but uh, I was in the army for two years and uh, went to Europe for two years. And uh, I was, uh, I, you know, when you're away from your country, you learned a lot about it. Mm. So I, I did uh, put my duffel bag down and uh, kiss the ground when I came back from uh, being over here in Europe for two years. But when, when we were on the ship coming into New York Harbor, these guys had these wonderful uh, German radios that they had bought over there. And so they started picking up New York stations. And the first thing they heard was a commercial for a meat market. Mm. They, they absolutely applauded. They hadn't heard a commercial for two years. And that commercial was right in the middle of a newscast. 
That was my epiphany. I knew at that very moment I was going to be spending the rest of my life in news and advertising, the most American things there are. Wow. And, uh, and so we do. You know, uh, 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 we Tumbleweed, somebody just emailed, and I have to agree, two of the most famous and, and um, inspirational Texas women for me were Molly Ivins and Ann Richards. Did you ever get to interview them? Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> they set the they set the the the, the standard without right. a doubt. Molly Ivins and Ann Richards for sure. Or no, no, I did not. But I I have recordings, and I and 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 I you know thought about using them those recordings, but uh, since I didn't do it, I, I I didn't want to. But of course, of course, they are the most, and, and, and Kathy L. Murphy, I think, is in that category. <laughs> Everybody's making me cry today. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Well, I actually, I actually was down in Austin, Texas, and Kathy Kamen Goldmark, who was a friend of mine um, who lived out in San Francisco, started the Rock Bottom Remainders. It's a, a band made up of New York Times bestselling authors, and I was going to do her hair for the concert down there during the Texas Book Festival. And when I went, there sat Molly Ivins. And she turned to me and she's watching me do Kathy's hair. And she goes, Kathy, she goes, are you using Aquanet on Kathy's hair? And I said, oh, no, Molly, I'm using Redken because I, you know, I have a Redken shop. She goes, well, honey. She goes, here in West Texas, we use Aquanet. And I can just hear her voice. And uh, she was one of my favorite people. And to meet her in person was just pretty amazing. But you're doing a wonderful thing because not only are you capturing storytelling through radio, you're also oh. capturing um, American stories. This should be, you know, we have a... Um, um, a place that where um, we can house all of these recordings of these famous, like, didn't you say Pancho Villa, Villa's wife? You interviewed her. I mean, yes. this is amazing, uh, the history sure. that you've done in your, your career of radio, 50 years of radio. So um, I am thrilled to showcase you. Anybody else want to speak up or uh, have a comment or... Um, I'm looking back and forth on the pages of uh, uh, love to hear more from any Listen, of you. I, I, I don't do this by myself. I couldn't, right. do, I couldn't do all the button pushing and everything. My wife, Susan, that's. I love around, Susan. Roll Hi, around. Susan. <laughs> I, I gotta tell you, you guys, I gotta tell you, uh, Stephanie Chance who's a good friend of mine and I've both been interviewed by Tumbleweed and Tumbleweed came to my little cabin in the woods and, and you got to tell the story of what happened when you got here, Tumbleweed. Juana Anderson Neal was with me and what happened when you got here? Well, it was wet. It had been <laughs> raining. Tumbleweed had broken his foot and had had surgery and he was in a wheelchair. There was no sidewalk. I don't know how we managed, but Kathy, you were a big part of it. We may, I managed to get him up to your steps. The steps were wet. You got a towel, you put it, you put it over the steps and tumbleweed scooted up on his bottom all the way up your steps. And we got the wheelchair up top and rolled him into your house. And th there wasn't a big space and we managed not to break anything in your lovely house. And that's hard to do. But that was, I couldn't believe he scooted up on his rump. <laughs> it was just, he's such a good sport, but I never, it never dawned on me that he couldn't walk, you know, so because he broke his foot or whatever. But last time I saw him, he was the keynote speaker at the Gladewater Chamber of Commerce, and it was a big hit. To see him live is just amazing. And you got to see him here today. So, Thank you, Susan Tumbleweed. You're awesome. It was so Any much last words you want to share with our listening audience? 
we 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 are, are, are privileged to uh, be able to be on this uh, international broadcast <laughs> and 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 spread the words about Texas and uh, and and book writing and and radio and everything to uh, to your audience. And it 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 means so much to uh, be able to do this anywhere, anytime. Uh, we love doing it. We do a lot of chamber banquets and things like that. Not many since the COVID uh, since COVIDism. <laughs> but uh usually we we we're busier speaking uh doing speaking but haven't been, done, been doing a whole lot of that lately because of that but uh we 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 love doing it we do a lot of things we have an ad agency we have a production company we do commercials etc cetera, etc cetera. but uh i think the most fun is doing this you know doing our doing our, our, yes. our in our, our speeches yeah. Well, this is recorded and it, it was will be downloaded when we finish. And after the weekend, I will be putting them up on my Kathy L. Murphy channel on YouTube. And I will send you the link so you can maybe make it a radio broadcast. We, whatever you want to do, uh, we will help you in any way. But I'll send it to you. I'll send it to you, Bob and Susan. Thank you. For being yes, such I, great I, sports you. and you had such a hard time getting on out in west texas uh we <laughs> just everybody turn your mute button off big round of applause oh thank you so much thank you so much and a and tip of the hat privilege. a privilege. tip privilege. of the hat from the pulpwood queen so thank you so much and we'll see you down the road tumbleweed bye susan bye bye bye, bye.